We are now moving on to the very north of Europe, to uh, Finnmark, which is the northernmost region in Norway, a region with borders both to Finland and Russia. It's uh, by far the largest uh, region of Norway. And that is where my uh, colleagues, Morten Rud, who is sitting there, is the editor-in-chief in NIK Finnmark. And uh, about Morten, we could say that he is also a former Moscow correspondent for NIK, so he's Russian-speaking, that can be helpful these days. Uh, and Ida Karine Gulvik, who is a reporter in Kirkenes, which is the town that is very close to the Russian border. Uh, we have seen a lot, we have seen uh, enormous amounts of refugees and migrants crossing the borders in the south of Europe in the most tragic ways. But still, we were quite uh, shaken and surprised when they suddenly started to cross the border to Norway. You have the word, my friends. Thank you, Donna. Good afternoon, all of you. And um, we will now try to uh, give you a little um, uh, glimpse of what the Arctic route uh, for the migrants was and um, where it is. So, first, a little refreshment about where we are. Um, for the uh, migrants from Syria, the route started of course in Syria and went over to Lebanon and Beirut from where they bought uh, tickets for a plane to Moscow. From Moscow they went uh, either by plane or by train to uh, Murmansk which is uh, the northern city of the uh, northwestern city in, in Russia about 250 kilometers uh, from Kirkenes, which is the Norwegian border town. I'll show you a more detailed map about uh, from the border zone. You see down uh, in this map you have uh, the town Nikel, which is an industrial town uh, and where the refugees gathered uh, and queuing up to cross the border, which is, uh, you follow the, the line, the blue line in this uh, map, to Storskog, which is the crossing point, about 30 kilometers away. This is a military zone and it's restricted area for, uh, for uh, even for Russians who are not living in this zone. And for us, uh, Norwegians uh, and uh, anybody else living in the, within the Schengen area. And from the uh, border crossing, you have about 12 kilometers to the town of Kirkenes. Kirkenes is uh, a town uh, inhabited about, uh, with about 6,000 inhabitants. Uh, the area around Kirkenes totally. About 10,000. It is called Norway's Little Russia. And you can see the signs of the streets are named in two languages, or in one language, but written also with the Cyrillic uh, uh, alphabets. So, uh, and you see uh, this little uh, uh, entrance. There is our local office uh, for MRK, where Ida Karine and her two colleagues are working. So, uh, when this started, uh, or started to increase, uh, we will start this uh, little uh, performance, and uh, here we go. Jag tänkte tillbaka på oss som har varit oss, det kändes nästan som att man har varit med i en film på något sätt, eller som turist i det. Jag mötte ju människor som sa att det här kommer till att vara en katastrof, 
folk har forstået på det her, og så det kommer lidt alt for mye til i kommunen, og at det skulle ikke finde noget. De kom hver dag, tusindvis af mennesker. Men hvorfor tager spændt på bagage og vente? Jeg støtter jul. En strøm av unge og voksne og gamle. I flere måneder var Storskog i Finnmark stedet der Norge møtte verden. Da vi møtte krigene i Afghanistan og Syria. Da vi møtte drømmen om Europa. That was a part of The Wind is Dark, a documentary movie that we made uh, earlier this spring. I'll try to give you a quick overview of what the Arctic Refugee Route was and what kind of challenges it posed to us as journalists. And it all started very, very small uh, with a tiny ad in a local newspaper in about March, February of 2015, uh, where someone asked if there were anyone in Kirkenes who could uh, drive across the border to pick up two Syrian boys uh, who wanted to cross the border. And those two, even though we didn't know it at the time, were among the first uh, of what would become a, a flood of 5,400 people who crossed, uh, who used the Arctic route while it was open. Um, as Morten said, people traveled from Syria to Lebanon, uh, Lebanon to Russia, and then on to Norway, where they, no, to uh, Murmansk, where they hitchhiked or paid someone, or placed an ad in a newspaper, in this case, uh, to get across the border. And in the beginning, a lot of people asked, why, why this route? Um, and I guess the answer that we got most of the time was that it's safe. Compared to crossing the, Ar uh, the Mediterranean on a tiny raft and paying smugglers, it was comparatively safe. Some people also said that it was cheaper. We heard uh, earlier that it was the most expensive route. I haven't compared prices, uh, but what we were told was that it actually was cheaper to just buy plane tickets instead of paying bribes and paying smugglers. Uh, but even, even still, like the first six months of 2015, not a lot of people used this route. Um, and for people in Norway, it was sort of like uh, absurd and uh, curious that a conflict in the Middle East would have these sorts of uh, repercussions in the North, in the Arctic, thousands of miles away. And it wasn't until the summer of 2015 that it became clear that the rumors of this route had spread and that the situation could become very serious. Uh, so the government tried to react. Uh, first, the Norwegian police uh, started warning Norwegians that you can't pick up people in Russia and take them across the border, that will be people smuggling, uh, that is not allowed. Um, and then the refugees had to, or asylum seekers had to find a different solution, and that is when you get images of Det hele startet med en ny type reisandes, som plutselig begynte å krysse denne linja, Schengen sin nordligste grense, som skiller Russland fra Norge. Hvor er du fra? Syria. Hvordan gikk du til å komme denne veien? Ja, de er mine venner. De er mine venner. Hvor lang tid det tok deg å komme fra Syria til her? Det var en uke. En uke? Can you tell us what the, the plan was? Where did you go first? Uh, it's also a bit uh, complicated. Uh, From Turkey to where? From Turkey, Russia, here. Yeah. You had a visa? Yes. I see. Was it easy to get here? Uh, no. No? Very hard. <laughs> These kinds of images became sort of symbolic of the Arctic route people crossing the border from Russia on bikes with their luggage and their kids. And uh, the question that soon came from all over the world was, why bikes? Uh, and the simple question is that this is a military zone, the Russian uh, government doesn't allow anyone to cross the border on foot. You have to have a vehicle, and um, an inexpensive and fairly easy to get vehicle is a bike. Um, so that's the reason for the bikes. And it created a thriving bike market on the Russian side of the border. Um, and also an, an enormous pile of uh, abandoned bikes on the, on the Norwegian side. And it, it was an incredibly visual uh, situation and it caught the attention of the world press. Uh, at our time in the Lovis, we had Al Jazeera and BBC knocking on the door, where are the refugees? How can we, um, where can we find them? We also had French TV who gave us and just saw. And 
I think that this played a part in also advertising the route. Later on, we met a lot of people who said that, no, I'm worried about it in the Washington Post uh, about this route, and that's why we chose it. Um, and uh, because people found out about the route through the media, a lot of people started coming. This isn't anything like the situation in Greece. Um, there, were, there was thousands of people coming up, tens of thousands. But still, uh, the Norwegian government wasn't prepared to deal with this. Um, there's all the infrastructure to handle asylum seekers is in the south. Uh, this is in the Arctic. Uh, in the winter, uh, the temperature drops to minus 20, minus 30 degrees. Where would these people go to stay? How would we transport them to their, their new homes? Um, and well, <coughs> what should we do with them? All this creates some really strange situations where asylum seekers are placed in old hotels, uh, bomb shelters, and in remote islands. Ja, det är klart det är bekymra, för det är att det är begränsat på marken kan svälla undan. Bara som ett exempel så får jag besked om när jag kommer hit till Kirkenes att det sändes ut tre bussar för Kirkenes idag. Vi har inte någon plats att göra det, så det är, vi måste finna plats med en steg på E6. Det är vår värld. Bussar från Kirkenes kör västover och söder, någon gång i flera dagar, på jakt efter steg för oss utsökare att kan bo. En av bussen är nog här och kan göra i Hammerfest. Här väntar båten till Öja Seila. Det är sju fast på honom där för att föra. Nu blir det 60 till. Where are you going? Uh, I don't know, but uh, they said me we are going to Island. I, I didn't meet at this place before. Where do you come from? I came from Afghanistan. Det är inte längre bara syrer av, men människor från över 40 olika nationer som följer den arktiska fullkrutan. De kommer från Iran och Irak, Afrika och Europa, från Filippinerna och från Sydamerika. Och jag alla är på flykt från krig. Det är många som kommer hit som, inte, som är rätt och slett grundlösa och sysselsökare. Och sånt samfunnet för övrigt och den här folkevandringen som är till gång i vilken Norge nå, så må det vara sett att det är viktigt att få luka av disse med en gång och eventuellt borta lukvist den. Men då bestämmer vem som ska få bli av asylsökare på Seiland och andra akutmottag runt om i Norge och vem av dem som ska sändas ut. Det ska visa sig att bli vanskelig. Uh, Ceylon was a, a pretty spectacular place and uh, this was one of the places where we got access to see how the refugees live. But our problem as journalists is that uh, some of those uh, emergency housing uh, arrangements that were made for the asylum seekers were, were made inaccessible by the government. Especially close to the border in Kirkenes, uh, where the pressure was high, uh, where there were a lot of people coming every day, uh, we weren't able to get in and see how everything worked and how they were actually living. Uh, which means that we lack documentation of large parts of what became the largest refugee crisis in Norway since the war. Um, another problem that we meet at this point is the question, why is this happening? Uh, and many people were wanted to know what, why, why isn't Russia stopping this? Russia should be protecting the border, it's a Schengen border, we must have agreements for this, they shouldn't just be letting people through. Um, and when we got photos from Russia, we saw that more and more uh, migrants and asylum seekers kept arriving. They got the vibe. Man had to first stop it, but it was not allowed to stop it in the military zone. Many of them in the army boots and shoes and jackets and the skin for them dress. Näst sista stopp på ruta till Norge är den russiska gränsbyn Nikel. Här samlas alla de som väntar på att kryssa gränsen. Men som motar kan kyrkorna skulle så upp, så kommer hundrevis av nya asylsökare hit. Så det hotellet så var det ju kyrkpapp 
hakka flyktingar på det. Allt han låg i vår gamla och det var fullt på alla dom. Ja, det är lite på att stå full över gränsen där. My story is more of the story of problems, the story of, you know, um, unfortunate, you know, and, and as, as all you people you see around you, you know. So, we're all trying to, you know, cross the border, you know, to, you know. I once said to Norway people, help, look at a lot of people in here. They are wants to go to Norway. I said to Norway people, help, help somebody. The question, why isn't Russia stopping this, creates a lot of speculation. Um, people ask, is this, is this a punishment because of the sanctions? Is this because we're a NATO member and because of the heightened tension between Russia and the West? Uh, and it becomes, uh, it creates a lot of uh, conspiracy theories. And a lot of people quickly revert to a sort of Cold War uh, idea of the Machiavellian Russia that can create a refugee crisis, crisis in order to, to destabilize Norway. And as a journalist, it's really challenging because how should we deal with these stories? They are hard to refute or validate. Uh, and it's very difficult to get officials in Russia to uh, give some sort of comment about this. So we are on our side speculating, not really knowing what's going on on the Russian side and how they deal with this. And personally, I feel as a child of the Cold War, I feel, I feel it's very easy to believe those stories or those ideas experiences about Russia. Um, so how to filter all that speculation becomes very challenging. Now we know that it was it's very unlikely that this was a conscious move on the behalf of Russia. Um, but we're still not completely clear on why so many people could cross the border. Another problem, uh, now there are almost 200 people crossing the border each day. Usually there used to be 10 per year across this border, 10, 10 asylum seekers every year. Now there's all, almost 200 each day. And these are people in extreme situations. And how should we handle the stories of the asylum seekers themselves? Uh, many times the first thing people say to you when you meet them in refugee centers is, do you want to hear my story? And it quickly becomes clear that this is their, uh, to me at least, it seems like this is their currency. This is the only currency they have. Uh, they need you to tell their story, to maybe enhance their chances of staying in Norway. Uh, and they also ask us to be kind. Don't don't say anything that can um, uh, damage my, my case. Um, one example uh, was this guy from Jordan, who was the only one in the refugee center that we had the contact information to. We could call him. He spoke good English. We needed him to find people on the inside of this refugee center. But in an interview, we asked him where he was from. He said he was from Jordan. We, uh, this was published, and they got a lot of negative reactions because people were like, he's from Jordan. He's not a, he's not a, re a, a real refugee. And he heard about this neg negative feedback and was angry at us. Uh, so there was this balance that you had to find because we, and it, in some cases, you, you just want to be a person. Be, be kind, hear the story, and tell the story, because you yourself feel sympathy for these people. But that's not your job, and it's a difficult line to tread. This becomes particularly challenging when the situation on the border becomes even more tense in January 2016. In December, the border was finally closed um, due to an agreement with Russia and some technical stuff that I won't get into now. Um, but soon after, Norway started sending asylum seekers back to Russia, um, simply put because uh, Russia is, according to the Norwegian government, a safe country, and if you pass through this country, you should seek asylum there, <coughs> not in Norway. Uh, and they take them to this camp outside of Kirkenes, an old military camp that has been redone as a refugee facility for uh, 600 people. Um, and uh, they bring families and children, it's minus 30 degrees outside, uh, this situation uh, again creates a lot of uh, focus on Kirkenes and what's happening there. It's kind of strange because when it started the, uh, sending people back, nobody noticed, almost nobody noticed. And then a month passes, maybe it was Christmas, that people were done with Christmas, but 
but in January, everyone sees what's going on. The entire uh, representatives for the entire Norwegian press come to this tiny little place and it's uh, And uh, in addition to this, there's also a new, some new actors on the stage. There's local activists who oppose the returns and want to stop them. And uh, they get involved, they organize demonstrations, they issue press releases, and they also try to help people escape from the camp. We interviewed, in a documentary, we interviewed Lynetta, one of the women who tried to help a family get away. Then on the morning, there are many asylum seekers out of Australia, for the press and political people. They ask those who stand on the parking lot, they must be shot bort. They will not get asylum. En syrisk familie, to voksne og tre unge, ber en venn om å rette om hjelp. Og så spurte han om bare, hva er det som skjer? Og da var hun veldig så oppgira og fortalte da at denne familien hadde satt seg inn i bilen hennes, men politiet hadde skjær av veien, de hadde jo fysisk satt Maria foran hennes bil, og hun fortalte at de hadde tatt seg fra og tatt skap, og hun spurte at hun kom seg inn i vei. Familien står på lista av folk som skal returneres til Russland denne dagen. Den eldste jenta er 12 år gammel. Den yngste er 12 år. Foreldrene snakker litt engelsk. Mora sier bare en ting. Nå går det selv. I bilen og faren og satt og sa ingenting, og mora i baksette var helt hysterisk, og lille jenta skrek, og det var, jeg tenkte egentlig ikke, altså jeg husker bare tenkte på at det var å komme til bilen. This episode marks the end of the Arctic route. A few days later, Russia says that they refuse to accept any more refugees across the northern border. The returns of asylum seekers continues, but now by plane from Oslo to Moscow or St. Petersburg. But it's very limited in scope, but maybe 20 people have been sent back since February. And in, but in Norway, many of the people who came across this route are still waiting for answers. They don't, many of them don't know if they're going to stay in Norway or be sent back to other countries or other their countries of origin. And Norway, including Finnmark and Northern Norway, will have to figure out how to handle this new influx of people. Where will they live? Where will, where will they work? Uh, who gets to say who has to go? So it seems clear that the Arctic route, even though it's now closed, will continue to affect the work we do as journalists for a long, long time. Denmark have 31 journalists, three as I said in Kikkenes, and uh, we had uh, definitely our high time this uh, last war zone. 
Uh, one of the problems was, as uh, Ida said, getting answers from the Russian side. This is a Norwegian woman that was uh, on a visit on the Russian side, who told uh, us that uh, she was offered money from the from the Russian uh, border uh, guards, the, the authorities there, uh, for taking asylum seekers in her car, which is not legal. Um, of course, it's very, very difficult to have any kind of answer to that from the Russian side, but uh, we tried to call them, and they, of course, rejected it. That is uh, one thing. And the other thing, the most important thing, is that what we also said, mentioned, uh, that the accusations from Norwegian side about this conspiracy from the Russians, uh, that they are uh, more or less punishing her uh, for the sanction of uh, this uh, occupation of, uh, of the Crim area. Um, but we never got an answer to that when we asked them. They gave a statement uh, after some time, and that was it. Another problem was uh, this uh, migrant camp uh, right outside Kirkenes. It was an abandoned military camp that was uh, set, uh, yeah, brushed up a little bit, but you can see the conditions here. They are living in more or less in containers. Um, and we were not allowed access to this camp um, uh, except from uh, one or two times when they prepared a press uh, show off uh, and showed us some rooms, but we didn't have access uh, where they actually lived. We are uh, dominated the national news uh, for a period about two and a half months, I would say. Uh, we used uh, not only the three uh, journalists in Kirkenes, we also transferred people from the main office in Alta. And uh, we all had so much overtime that we uh, could have been <laughs> could have been filed a case, a uh, legal case, uh, against us if we didn't uh, slow it down. So we called for help for all, from Oslo as well. So they also came and helped us uh, during this period. This is Ida in uh, 30 minus degrees while they are reporting uh, migrants. So what is so uh, special about this border? It is 196 kilometers common border with Russia. It is the outskirt of the Schengen uh, area. It was during the Cold War, it was a more or less closed uh, border. Uh, figures up to 100 persons crossed the border during that time a year. Uh, last year or the year before, it was about uh, up to 400,000 uh, crossing the border uh, due to the new uh, regime that uh, occurred after the Cold War. Uh, and uh, this is emphasized by these two prime ministers. It's, uh, it's uh, Medvedev from Russia and Stoltenberg uh, from Norway in 2013 while they are celebrating the Barents uh, Cooperation, which is a regional cooperation that goes uh, over the border and uh, is a kind of warm and functioning cooperation uh, in this, uh, how to say, new situation that has occurred after the occupation of Ukraine. Yes, I think that's it.